I just changed the uh, subject because it doesn't make anesthesia safe. You cannot really make a patient fit with technology. This is in 1884 where chloroform was given by William Morton and this paved the way for anesthesia practice. I was very fortunate to use ether and some of you must have witnessed the use of open drop techniques, but we have moved a long way with a lot of advanced anesthesia machines and, hemod and monitoring with the hemodynamics, the brain, even the, uh, the, uh, the respiratory system and the kidneys. Neuro volatile anesthetic, anesthetic agents and muscular relaxants and endotracheal tubes. I've been working in uh, orthopedics for a long, long time, since 94, and this is the reason why I would uh, speak more on regional anesthesia techniques, which where we used simple hypodermic needles and uh, two epidural needles for loss of resistance technique for interscaline and lumbar plexus block. But then in, uh, in 1999, uh, we started using the neurostimulation technique. We abandoned the paresthesia. We started using the site-specific uh, anesthesia, like interscaline block for the shoulder surgeries. Then in uh, 2008, when I first attended the World Congress, I was one of the few uh, delegates attending the workshop in ultrasound. I bought the first ultrasound along with my wife, and we started practicing the uh, regional techniques. And uh, to my surprise, you can see that 98% of the times we had used paresthesia, and now we don't use any anymore, and we use a lot of ultrasound in our anesthesia practice. Ultrasound has helped in identifying the neural targets, the spread of local anesthetic agents, and this is a popliteal block out of plane. And then we know when the local anesthetic it surrounds the popliteal uh, nerves, it's the time to uh, stop injecting the local anesthetic. Abnormal structures, if you any find any, they can be easily um, can be taken out of, out of target, and then you can um, produce a good efficient block. Um, this has really played a part for low volume, uh, low volume, and you can see the, the decreased time of the block. It takes hardly 0.8 seconds for the block to be completed with increased success and efficacy and decreased number of compl complications. Ultrasound has also uh, provided a development of new blocks like the costoclavicular and adductor canal block. I do a lot of contrast studies and I found that if you give a distal adductor block, you don't really need to give an IPAC, which is routinely given for the knee surgeries. So the meta-analysis of these uh, procedures, ultrasound guided, has proved that ultrasound is really pr produces a good efficient block with a good positive outcome. Three-dimensional, I did a few studies with the three-dimensional, but it really proves very expensive. Uh, this is a needle which is going into the interscaline, that's the sheath and the root, which we can clearly see, but that's going to be uh, 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 very, um, uh, uh, I mean, it's going to be very expensive in, in future. But what ultrasound has taught is not what not to do. Like, for example, we have the vascular structures close to the brachial plexus, a blind needle insertion here, and injection of local anesthetic can be catastrophic. This is a neurofibroma of the brachial plexus, could be a possible contraindication. If you give a brachial plexus a blind, then it, this could be a problem in, for, for, the, for the patient too. But what has really changed the, uh, uh, the, the practice of ultras uh, ultrasound is the, the truncal blocks, which has revolutionized the pain management in, in orthopedics. Uh, we used to give a lot of these thoracic uh, epidural and, uh, and the uh, uh, thoracic paravertebral blocks, which are now uh, contraindicated in patients with coagulopathies, spinal cord injuries, and paravertebral hemorrhages. So what we do now is we give ultrasound-guided bilateral, it is called a serratus anterior plane block, that's called a SAP block, and we have moved away from the neuroaxial technique to the interspinous plane block, which is the, uh, for the posterior fractures, the SAP block is for the lateral fractures, and then we give the, uh, the, for the anterior fractures, and for the sternal fractures, we give the parasternal. Now, we had few cases of sternal fractures in, in whom routinely we go for non-invasive ventilation. But then if you give these kind of blocks where you place the catheters in the parasternal area, and you can, this is the contrast study, you can see the entire uh, uh, contrast lying in the retrosternal area. It gives a good pain relief. Catheters kept for 14 days. They are infused with infusion pumps uh, with 0.1% ropevacant for 7 to 10 ml per hour, and the patient is ambulatory on the sixth or the, or the seventh day. Some of the unknown blocks in spine surgery. Spine surgery routinely done under general anesthesia requires a lot of pain relief in the post-operative period in the form of either intravenous fentanyl or intravenous morphine. I started giving the submultifidus block and the erectospinal block. We did some pilot studies and now we are doing some randomized controlled trials. We found that there's a decrease in the requirement of general anesthetic and very less number of patients, they go on uh, post-operative intravenous infusion of fentanyl. Uh, these are the catheters which are placed, and this is the contrast study which has been conducted in the erectospinal block. You can see that they, they, they move into the paravertebral uh, areas. And this is the, uh, the sub multifidus block where the catheter for one of the cases was kept to understand where exactly it is placed between the multifidus and the longissimus, where the dorsal rami they usually are. 
are present and they are blocked with this uh, continuous infusion of local anesthetic. The result, less number of uh, patients going in the post-operative period on intravenous fentanyl and the side effects of fentanyl has been decreased a lot. To understand whether really there is a role of truncal blocks, uh, I've started doing the thermography for these techniques. Like the patient who is on the SAP block, we do a thermography in the uh, uh, immediate post-block period to understand whether there is a rise in the temperature. So the truncal blocks cause a sympathetic um, um, blockade leading to vasodilatation cutaneous will definitely lead to a rise in the temperature. And some of the controversies which are surrounding these truncal blocks are going to settle with the uh, use of thermography in regional anesthesia. Coming to scoliosis, which is a very difficult uh, and uh, very challenging for the anesthetist. We, I did this with the loss of resistance and tactile feed. I could go through this large defect, but this could cause a neural injury as well as a spinal cord injury. So what they have come out with is a, a BETS a, a ultrasound guided, um, a portable ultrasound guided uh, the technique where you can use an ultrasound to identify the interlaminar area. It identifies the distance from the skin to the epidural space and it also uh, understands the uh, angle which the, the, the epidural needle has to make when it, it, it goes into the, uh, into the epidural space. So this is some of the uh, recent technology which is going to come into picture and we are using some of these techniques. Coming to uh, the monitoring system, the Edward system is one of the one which has to be used by each and every anesthesiologist in the in future to optimize the fluid stroke volume and the cardiac output. We did a pilot study in, in grade SA3-4 for fracture intertrochs uh, under epidural and lumbosacral block and, and it proved to be really, really useful. This is one of the important techniques, the cervical epidural, which have been used for the uh, patients of proximal humerus, not all patients, but some of them. Uh, you can literally place the catheter and stimulate the epidural space. Like in this case, you can see the right side is to be operated and the catheter lies very closely on, onto the right side. You can precisely place the tip of the catheter, use very, very low volume of local anesthetic. So if you, the intrascalin, if you use around 20 ml with, uh, with the cervical epidural, you can use hardly 5 ml of local anesthetic. In the post-operative period, they can be kept on the infusion pumps. So the, the tip of the catheter precisely placed, low volumes of local anesthetic used, and in the post-operative period, you can use an infusion pump. Now, this is a new net. Now, you can, you can literally pass from the, uh, the caudal area right up to the cervical area. You can see that this is the lumbar root stimulation. And then as the catheter goes right into the uh, cervical epidural space in the new knit, uh, you, you can see the, the stimulation of the uh, brachial plexus or the cervical roots. So literally in that case, in, in orthopedics, you can, you, you can operate and postoperatively you can use this for analgesia, maybe on the upper limb or um, in the thorax, in the abdomen, or maybe in the lower limb. Uh, in, in the lower limb. So these are some of the advances in technology in, the, uh, uh, in, in anesthesia as well. So what is in store for us? In 2040, it could be robot-based anesthesia, and I came across several articles, and this is a, uh, this is a prototype of a robotic nerve block where you can see that uh, this is the needle which is being advanced under ultrasound, and, uh, and under ultrasound guidance, that the needle is driven into the meat to block the nerve. So this could be a possibility, and maybe we will be replaced with, with, the, with robots or we can have robotic assistance. So a robotic intubation, a robotic nerve block, and a robotic anesthesia, this is what is in store for us. Now, if you see this, uh, this is one uh, system, this is called the robotic anesthesia uh, uh, system, which was used for colonoscopies, and there was a lot of hue and cry among the American Society of Anesthesiologists, as they usually do, and they say that they will be replacing us uh, uh, too soon. The cost of human um, uh, anesthetics was $2,000, while the cost of the robotic uh, uh, anesthetics was uh, just $200. So that was the massive difference between these two, uh, two anesthetists. This is the first robotic tracheal intubation performed for robotic prostatectomy, which had a success rate of 91% in 11 patients, and there were no complications at all. Same person, Hammerling, uh, he used the first robotic ultrasound-guided nerve blocks in humans, and he found that the time difference was almost 20 seconds when you compare the human uh, nerve block versus the robotic nerve block. So, Maybe in future, you'll be carried by drones from the recovery room and dropped on the operating table and surrounded by robots who will cannulate you, who will intubate you, and who will also give you a nerve block. I can't wait to see the future. Thank you very much.